Welcome to Inform TV. I'm Alan Repke, Alexandria, Minnesota. Today we're going to this uh, uh, fifth day of October. We're going to look at an Obamacare discussion led by Minnesota's only remaining conservative group. And uh, uh, whether Republican or Democrat, you'll find it extremely interesting. Uh, I was told about it by a uh, Tea Party Republican that said I had to go there and he'd give me a hundred bucks if I, I went there. So I got everything lined up and of course being a, a, a typical Republican Tea Party or when I said now I'm ready for my hundred bucks and I'll, I've changed my mind. It's probably not something to see. But anyway, uh, um, uh, he did come back and uh, I wink at him as I'm saying this of course and gave me a hundred bucks. Uh, uh, so I, I went to the meeting, it's excellent discussion, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, you're, you're truly going to enjoy it. And uh, it's the kind of discussions we should have on all uh, political policy and what's going on in these times. But uh, the interesting thing that, that caught my attention in this, this whole process was that uh, these rhino Republican Tea Partiers, uh, their head guy has been in the news lately, uh, Paul Walzer, the, the ultimate liberal uh, of these groups hiding as uh, uh, Tea Partiers and Republicans, you know, uh, they're all Republicans, they're all conservative, but they've got their hand up to their shoulder in the pocket of Uncle Sam all the time with getting super tax breaks and farm subsidies and crop insurance where millionaire farmers uh, only pay 40% uh, of the premium, the taxpayer pays the other 60% uh, percent and those type of thing. Uh, in fact, I think you'll see, and next thing in the middle, in my opinion, you're going to see uh, Paul Walzer and these Tea Party Republicans with their arm around uh, uh, Governor Dayton because in the wee hours, the, the, our governor said he's uh, for taxing the rich, do you realize uh, if you're a, a small businessman like uh, uh, Paul Walzer or a farmer that you, Graham and Grandpa, can leave $10 million to you in Minnesota with no inheritance tax. So I, I think it's interesting in this whole process. Uh, the reality is uh, we've got Tea Partiers and Republicans that are going to be on guard to make sure that Amy Klobuchar Colin Peterson and Tim Walls get back in office and, and they're going to be really nervous at the ballot box and they'll be on their, their cell phone, you know, holding it. Are you sure we can vote uh, Republican? We're definitely going to get Amy Klobuchar back uh, and uh, 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 Colin Peterson and Tim Walls, aren't we? Because we got to have those guys because, I mean, these guys, uh, these three have made us Republicans and us Tea Partiers millionaires and and many, many benefits that the common person doesn't know about. You know, you talked about the, the orchestra in the, uh, uh, Minneapolis that people were shocked at the salaries. If you actually see what farmers and small business and, and professionals are making, uh, the audience in Forum TV, you'd really be shocked. But anyway, I just want to bring you this discussion and it'll be on three parts for you guys on Charter, but if you get selective, you can see it all in one shot. And I'll try to post it on the website as well. But it, it, it's a very interesting discussion and how uh, we've just kind of lost our way uh, from having good discussions like this. And I salute this conservative group, the last conservative group in, in, in outstate Minnesota, the Douglas County Democrats who are not conservative enough for me, so I don't belong to them or the Republicans or the Tea Partyers because they're all too liberal for me. I want to say welcome to every single one of you. Howdy. Glad you came to the uh, discussion session. It's, it's really, I think, one of those kind of discussions that a lot of us don't know much about. We know there's a lot of political action on it. We know that there's a lot of kind of uh, negative comments that come out, but overall, the piece of legislation we're talking about is the Affordable Health Care Act of 19, uh, oops, of, 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 of 2010. So, I'm sorry, 2010. So we got a nice piece, I can't remember the date anymore. We got a nice piece of uh, legislation. The problem is, it's been implemented over a number of years. 
we've already had some parts implemented. The document itself is over 2,000 pages long. Tom used to work for the federal government. I used to try to read what a piece of legislation would look like. And then the rules and regulations come out, and if you think 2,000 pages is long on the act, then you had to try rules and regulations. It's books and books of material that states and individuals and organizations have to abide by. We've got an excellent group, people who are experienced in it. I'm going to just introduce quickly, and uh, we can get with that. Talk to Charles McKenzie right here. He's a practitioner, general family practitioner, 26 years, I believe. No, OB, OBGYN. Oh, you're the other one. Okay, I got the other one back there. <laughs> Steve has won 26 years down there. Steve, I'm glad, to, glad you could make it. Uh, Bill Flagg, he was the past CEO of Douglas County Hospital. A lot of experience in insurance, I'm sure. You can't live in medicine without all kinds of insurance. Mm -hmm. And the last one I have is uh, Charles McKenzie. Uh, Charles is retired. He currently works in the uh, uh, medical director of Prime West. Uh, I took a little time to look it up on the internet just to see what that meant because it had no meaning otherwise. The way we'll operate tonight is kind of a quick introduction by each of the three. We'll start down the far end with, uh, with uh, Steve. And uh, they can introduce both themselves, but they might also want to introduce something about their uh, opinion of the legislation, uh, the direction of legislation, and, and what might come to mind. I sent them some uh, possible considerations. Why is the Affordable Health Care Act of 2010 frequently called Obamacare? You know, that's kind of interesting. It's, it's used almost slangish when it's actually approved by the legislative bodies. So you have that. Will the Implementation Act require participation costs each, each individual Will, will require participation costs each individual more than the current system. Great big item. It's going to be more high price, less high price. What are the major provisions of the Affordable Health Care Act and when and how will they be implemented? Uh, will small businesses receive any support for implementation of health care program for employees? How will the Health Care Act affect the current hospital and clinic delivery systems? What will the pharmaceutical industries be affected by the implementation of the act, and what is their anticipated response? You could ask the question, how much money are we putting into lobbying? And the only thing I know is a lot. It's a lot of money going into it. Okay, I'm done talking. Steve, go right ahead. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I've been at the Alexandria Clinic for about 26 years now in family medicine. I've seen quite a few changes occur in that period of time. This is a a major piece of legislation changing the way that we approach health care uh, and the way that it's uh, uh, both ways practiced and the way it's paid for. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm kind of still in the trenches as it were, so I'm uh, having to deal with a lot of the changes that have already come in. And for the most part, they're quite beneficial. Um, uh, just a bit about the Obamacare in, medic in uh, medical school and residency, we're highly, highly uh, discouraged from using eponyms, putting people's names to anything. Uh, there's a few that never get away, like Parkinson's disease and things like that, but I don't refer to this by Obamacare, it's the Affordable Care Act. It was a little discouraging last night when he agreed to use that term, because it's not the name of the, of the, uh, of the act. Uh, so uh, we prefer to, at least I prefer to call it by its uh, real name, the Affordable Care Act, plus all the other stuff that came in front of it. Uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, so far it's been primarily focused a lot on the Medicare aspects. Um, we have the annual wellness exams, frequent, or I mean, I just made a mistake myself, frequently called um, wellness exams are actually annual wellness visits, um, looking at uh, preventive health concerns. Uh, people can come in um, uh, for a free consultation on where they are for their um, preventive services, going into things like um, colon cancer screening, prostate cancer screening, that's somewhat up in the air, of course, nowadays. Um, we look at their immunization status, look to make sure that their blood sugars and cholesterols are up to date. Those types of things are looked at and covered. A full examination is not, it is not a physical examination. And that some people have an understanding that the uh, well, annual wellness exam is a physical exam. It is not. Medicare only covers one physical exam when people turn 65. Um, after that, uh, the, uh, these are wellness visits. They can go into becoming full exams, uh, but that is not officially covered by Medicare. 
Medicare Advantage plans usually cover those, but Medicare uh, by itself does not. But that has actually been a wonderful entry door um, uh, where people can come in and look at wellness issues. Um, and it's very helpful to have. Uh, there's also been work so far for closing um, some of the donut hole issues. There was a rebate of $250, I believe, in 2010 for people that were in the donut hole to try and help cover some of the costs. They're trying to cut some of the costs in uh, um, uh, prescription drugs, trying to cut some of the costs in generic drugs, and trying to phase out the donut hole by about 2020 or so. Um, so again, most of the things that, are, that I've seen so far in practice have to do with uh, Medicare age recipients and has been very well received. A little harder to get things going through a clinic setting, quite a bit of additional paperwork, um, but when they work well, we actually are seeing that we're paying attention to uh, people's health, not just their illnesses, but their health, which is kind of a nice change. So uh, there are a lot of the changes that we'll be talking about over time, but pass this on to Bill. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a few thoughts where I'm coming from on the issue, and then we can get on the questions probably a little later. I'll just, uh, I'm Bill Flagg, uh, uh, past administrator of Douglas County Hospital. I've been there for 30, almost 38 years, so i um, been in the community a long time, born and raised in Alexandria. I did get away for school for a while, but I never came back. Great community. Glad to be here, and I'm still in training. My wife is still training me in retirement. <laughs> Very difficult for her. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Just a few points I'd like to make. First, I think something needs to be done with the health care system. When I first got into, into health care, it accounted for 6% of the gross domestic product. Today it's 18%. It just keeps on growing. And the gross domestic product, you can spend the whole thing on health care. So you've got to be real careful. That doesn't get much higher than that, I think. 20% would be horrendous, in my opinion. So point being, we have to do something about it. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on the Affordable Care Act. As most of you know, it's thousands of pages long. It's very extensive, complicated, and they're still writing the regulations for it. But uh, there's a lot of things on the Internet that you can get in Google and different parts of it. <coughs> I like the timeline and what's covered and what uh, uh, what, how, uh, what it's going to cost. And I can share a little bit of that tonight. I've got a little uh, chart that I can put up later to show you what it's going to cost at least individuals. Uh, my major concern is that it will cost too much, that the cost of this program is going to be just too much for us to handle. It's sort of like a lot of government programs that are overpromised and then end up being overspent. Uh, similar to Social Security and Medicare and medical assistance. They're all popular programs. I'm not against uh, the Affordable Care Act, but again, uh, some of the projections now are falling short. Short, it's too expensive, and we're going to have to deal with that down the line. That being said, I do not think that it will be repealed, even if, if Romney does get in. I think it will be tweaked or uh, some changes made, but certainly won't be repealed, that's my opinion. And I wouldn't be in favor of repealing it myself. I'm concerned that the combination of aging baby boomers and uh, adding 50 million people... <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned about the impact of both aging baby boomers and the impact of adding 50 million people that are currently uninsured to the system may overwhelm it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people uh, accessing care that weren't accessing as before. That's a good thing, but I am concerned if our system can handle that. What I mean by aging baby boomers is that people, would, when they reach age 65 and over, statistically, you use doctors and hospitals six to eight times more than people under age 65. So just the fact that this big bulge of people coming through the system and start utilizing services more that combined with the uninsured population that's going to be coming to the system, we could overwhelm it. I think there's quite a few concerns about that. Uh, one of the statistics that kind of uh, lends to that is that it, it, it appears there will be a physician shortage of about 90,000 physicians by the year 2020. And some are saying that might even be a little bit shy, it might even be uh, higher than that. And that's because of this increased demand and just the fact that changes in our population and just the demands that go along with that. So I am concerned about that. 
we're going to have to look at alternative <coughs> to just having a physician do everything, of course. And we're seeing someone have a physician assistant, and we're extended, but we're going to need a lot more of those. Um, those that are currently uninsured and below 400% of the federal poverty le level will like Ob Obamacare or Affordable Care Act because they're going to get it for the heavy subsidy. Some won't have to pay anything for the premium, which is good. They're 400% of the uh, federal poverty level, but they're going to like this. I think people that have really good coverage now and uh, have easy access to health care are probably not going to be as pleased. They're going to probably be able to access that, but it's going to cost them more. That's, that's my opinion, anyhow. Um, another point I want to make is we must insist that our legislators are on the same program as us. That, to me, is extremely important as we move ahead with this, because if we're out there getting one plan, we don't like it, and they're on a different one, it's going to be hard to convince them that uh, this isn't working very well, so for what it's worth. Uh, finally, I think that, uh, you know, you say, well, if you don't really like this, what would you do? You know, which, which way would you go? I think I would have gone for an approach, and I think, actually, President Obama and a lot of people that ended up with the Affordable Care Act wanted to do this also. I think Medicare for All would have been a better option for us. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. yeah, I think that would have been a much, we all know what Medicare is, figure out how we're going to pay for it, and just open it up to the entire population, and then subsidize it where it's needed. To me, that would have been a much easier way, uh, easier approach and less complicated approach. The other thing I would do, if you look at the way they're funding this, and that's for political reasons only, because it's the only way they could fund the Affordable Care Act, it's extremely convoluted and complicated. Nobody really knows if we have enough funding in there and how we're going to get enough funding to provide this care for everybody. I'm a strong believer that we should have had a, we should have a broad-based tax for this, that anybody that can, could, should pay in something. And a, a good example of a broad-based tax is the payroll tax. To me, if they would have doubled the payroll tax, which people go, oh my God, that's a lot of money. But this program's gonna cost a lot of money. And then every employer and then every employee would have to kick into it up to a certain level. And then you take the, the uh, income limits on FICA or Social Security, so that people make more money would still have to pay that percentage. To me, that'd be an understandable way to pay for it. People could understand that. There'd be a broader base of people paying for it. And to me, in my opinion, that would have been a better approach. I think most legislators would agree with that, but politically, it was very difficult to get that for what it's worth. That's where I'm coming from. Thanks, Bill. Charles, you're up next. Uh, Chuck. Uh, Chuck. I retired OBGYN. I know. Said the medical director for Prime West Health, which you may or may not know is uh, Medicaid, Medicare. We're the sole source provider for 13 counties for everybody that's on Medicare. I mean Medicaid, and then the dual eligible Medicare folks that are eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. So plus we have some handicapped folks, etc. So that's what I do, and I deal with these issues a lot more than I did when I was delivering babies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't disagree with anything they said. At one point about the name of the act. Uh, we don't call it Obamacare, it's PPACA is the way it's referred in my world, and that's Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And so it wasn't brought up a whole lot last night, certainly, and it's not necessarily the hot, it's, it's the area where I think both parties tend to agree. A lot of the insurance company reforms, I, I think, are very important. And when Romney says he's not going to repeal all of it, I'm sure that's the main area he's referring to. The fact that uh, you're you know, guaranteed portability, that you can get your kid on your health plan until he's 26 or she, um, those sorts of things. One issue in the debate last night that kind of bugged me was uh, Romney's statement that he is uh, not going to do, not going to enforce uh, prior uh, conditions. Pre-existing. Pre-existing. Pre there you go. Good man. Mm -hmm. Pre-existing conditions, and, and his plan. He's it's totally different than what the, the law says. He wants to limit it. If you've already got insurance, then okay, yeah, you won't be excluded with it into this plan. But at any rate, th those kind of issues. But mostly, there's a lot of good in this law of, of having to do with insurance reform, uh, maybe some of the pressure on the pharmaceutical industry to do some things, uh, et cetera. Now, 
one thing that, as Bill alluded to in this law, is it's going to cost money. I, I don't believe anybody says that this is going to be free, cheap, uh, a wash. It's going to cost money for some of the reasons Bill said. One of the things that concerns the insurance country, industry, for instance, not only the seniors, but all of these people who haven't had insurance for a long time, they have a lot of pent-up demands, a lot of needs that haven't been satisfied. And so the system will get swamped over, you know, up front with a lot of demands for health care. So that's a problem. But at any rate, cost is the issue. And to, to go away from that, cost is a function of what you do. And we'll, we'll not get necessarily get into the fee-for-service problems and all those issues that are very much, you know, on the table, I guess. But but cost is a function of benefits. And when this law was passed, uh, it says in there that the Secretary of HHS is supposed to determine a uniform benefit set. They had huge meetings, and I read long reports about it, and every special interest group in the country, from the toenail doctor to the baldness doctor, you know, was there, and they all expressed what they felt was the most important things. The net result was is that the committee, the commission that was Designed, couldn't do their job. They made recommendations, and the upshot was that uh, the secretary turned it over to the states. And so the benefit set now is basically is a, you know a certain uh, the set of benefits that's already on the average uh, small business plan. Now, plus some added things, the law mandates coverage for pregnancy, mental health, and stuff. And so that's threatening a lot of the small business people who might not get involved because right now they can design their uh, insurance plan and exclude certain things to save money to keep the costs down rather than you know raise the co-pay, raise the uh, co-insurance, etc. So they, they just haven't addressed the benefit issue and there's a lot of parts to that. One of the biggest problems in this country is we get too much health care. It's very difficult to convince people that as much as 30 percent of the health care we all get is unnecessary, even harmful, dangerous, it's, and so something has to be done about the benefit set. Now, how do you do that? I mean, if all these very intelligent, involved people in healthcare, you know, experts in their field, couldn't come up with a defined minimum benefit set, you know, who's going to do it? How can we do it? Well, part of the law is what's you know, comparative effectiveness research, and Romney made it, he didn't call it that, he called it the, uh, what was he called, the, the business where they're going to ration health care, and, and he said it about three times that, uh, you know, you can't have the government tell you what health care you can get, I mean, I can't think of the name, right, the, the official name, but effectively underlined is, is what's called comparative effectiveness research. And Obama, the Democratic side of the aisle, wanted that in the bill, and they wanted some teeth with it. And part of the teeth would have been if, if Medicare could use that information to, to determine what should be provided, what they'll pay for, and what they won't pay for. But that is all taken out. So there's funding for the Center for Innovation, and there's funding for comparative research and to determine basically what works or not. Uh, but so theoretically, that was taken out of the bill. And to me, that's the on only way we're going to get cost under control is to basically determine that, uh, you know, if a hospital wants to buy a new machine so that the, the doctor, a, a robotic machine so the doctor can do robotic surgery, it costs millions of dollars, okay? Well, somebody's got to decide, is it really that much better? If it's 1% better in terms of outcomes, but it costs twice as much, well, what's the comparative effectiveness might be about the same, but the cost, the cost efficiency is way less. And so, that has to be readdressed. It's that way in the United Kingdom, and uh, to me, that is the only way we're going to get a handle on the costs, uh, because we consume too much health care. We demand too much health care, and um, you know, there's all kinds of problems with health care in this country, but as far as I'm concerned, we have a patient problem, too. I mean, we're lousy patients, and in many, many ways, but at any rate, those are some of the things that bother me, uh, that concern me about the plan. But it is going to cost money, and they've got to get a handle on cost. I, I just add one point. I'm just getting you say, Chuck, is that if you look at other countries' plans, they've got these, these nationalized plans. People refer to them often. 
the, one of the major differences between the United States and these other countries is that a lot of these other countries didn't have very good health care to start with, and no people didn't have very good access, and they didn't have the specialization that we certainly have here when they put them in place. As Chuck is pointing out here, our, expect, our expectations are tremendous. We all want the best. We all want the Cadillac care. We don't get it here. We're going to go someplace and get it. If we need to go to mail, by gosh, we should be able to go. You know, and that's exactly what you're talking right. about. I think. And, well, yeah. and to get those expectations, I'm saying, well, you can't have that anymore. Well, who's going to tell me I can't have that anymore? So it's got to be tied to a payment increase in payment. But if you have everybody have the right to health care, then they're all going to be demanding that higher level of care, and that'll break the bank. That, that percent of GDP that's talking about will go up to 30 percent. It could go higher because we're insatiable when it comes to <laughs> health care. You know, they did the robot uh, thing he's talking about, but for prostate surgery, I think, primarily, oh, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Well, and and now they're saying that, and it was millions million dollars to do the prostate surgery. Now they're saying prostate surgery doesn't do any good. I think the latest study that came <laughs> out. And, and so here you spend all that money on something that doesn't even make a difference anymore. You know, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Steve, I thought you wanted to get in there a little bit too. Well, I was looking just to echo a lot of what Chuck said. Um, a lot of what this gets down to is education. And uh, that's one of the specialties in primary care is to try and educate people what's reasonable, what they can do, what they can expect, not expect, that type of thing. And there is a concern about the overwhelming. You know, everybody at the clinic, you know, and I'm sure everybody at Sanford is extremely busy. We have several. Um, um, uh, advanced health uh, practitioners in the form of uh, nurse practitioners helping out and such, uh, but we would need more uh, to handle more people coming in if it stays the way that it is. If we educate people what's reasonable, what's not reasonable, um, that can be uh, quite helpful. Uh, there are some things uh, in the uh, act to try and improve um, uh, the emphasis on primary care, um, less on specialty care. Um, you, not sure that I'm anyway an expert in the difference between the uh, amount of health care costs going to primary care versus you know, specialty care in the, uh, uh, in the national environment. But um, if we do try and keep people's expectations to where they should be, give reasonable care, and actually focus a lot on prevention, more so than just treating the illnesses, then hopefully we can reverse some of the things that are you know, the concerns about the law with the increase in the loss. Um, and uh, there are a lot of preventive services, and we start to think they're going to cost money. But if people stay healthier, then there may be cost savings in the long run. Um, and uh, to discuss, you know, just echo a little bit what Chuck was saying, there was discussions about, you know, health care rationing and death panels and things like that. It's not looking to see who should live or die. It's looking to see what really works and what doesn't work. Uh, right now, everybody out there, myself included, can kind of do anything you really want to do, whether it really makes sense or not. We want to know what really makes sense. And there are ways in the university settings in some of these that are trying to look at those issues as to what makes sense. There's a uh, place uh, somewhat based here in uh, Minnesota called ICSI, in Institute for Clinical Systems and Initiative. Uh, something. Anyway, they look at um, <laughs> guidelines for uh, back pain, health, um, heart failure, that type of thing. If we can find appropriate ways to treat people that really do work and not loading all the expensive new drugs and that type of thing on that may not be any better than the old drugs, there are different ways that you can pick and choose and keep the health care costs down to some extent um, and offset some of it. Thanks to the panel. Uh, let's open up questions from you people right out there. Uh, you can direct it to a specific person, Steve way down on the end, Bill in the middle, Chuck down on this end, or you can direct it to the panel and the panel can respond. So either way. You've got your hand up right there, sir? You know, uh, Bill, you, you talked about your concern about the uh, health care cost growth uh, and, and portion of GNP. And you talked a little bit of apples and oranges in terms of affordable care and baby boomer falls. Is, is there, can you enlighten us a little bit on, I mean, with the baby boomer falls is going to get in Medicare and independent of the health care program is going to run up costs substantially? Well, what I was trying to say is that our percentage of GDP spent on health care is at 18 percent. I think it's the highest of any other country in the world that we're spending that percentage of our gross domestic product. 
And that's a real concern, because every time you take another percentage, it takes away from somebody else. And, that's, and that is even without this baby boomer population coming through and adding these 50